Hello and welcome to Melbourne Baptist Church's service. My name is Stuart Clark and I'm the minister here. And I've got Emily with me today who is going to help us lead the musical worship. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. Andy Morley, also a church member of ours, is, uh, has, has an amazing job uh, at bringing our sermon to us today from Luke 7. And he's been out and about and it's exciting uh, to see him do that. It's great. Uh, last week we were praying for healing in our service and uh, that was a wonderful thing to do and we're going to continue to focus on the wonders of God's good news today as Andy preaches. We've also got another interview and uh, that's with Janet and we have missionary prayers with Beth as well. Uh, so thanks to everyone that's been involved in this service. It's a real encouragement to me. Uh, to see all of these things come together and for us to put them out on the Sabbath, on the Sunday. So let's start our time of devotion today by just reminding us of the praise that David brought in the Psalms. And this is Psalm 103 and it's verses 1 to 5. And it starts about looking at the soul. And of course, it's very important that our soul connection with God is good. The place in us where God dwells. And um, we start, so in Psalm 103, at the first verse. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my most innermost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. For who forgives all your sins? and heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion? Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles? Wonderful. So as we've looked at the praise and worship of David, we come now to a time of prayer or bringing praise and worship to our living God. So let's do that now. Let's bring a praise of pra prayer of praise. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we worship you. You are Lord of time and eternity. And God, at this time of pandemic, we recognise you are bringing your healing to people bringing your rest and restoring them. God, at this time of pandemic, you are loving your people, helping people through your people. And God, at this time of pandemic, would you hear our prayers of confession? Would you hear them now in this pause of silence? God, at this time of pandemic, again, we acknowledge that you are Lord of time and eternity. God, at this time of pandemic, you are calling people to an eternal home, a resting place with you. Help us in life, sickness and facing death to be faithful to you all of the days of our life. And so, Lord, we praise you. We worship you. You are Lord of time and eternity. And we again say together, Amen. We agree. And so now we're going to come to our first song. And it reminds us of the miraculous nature of God, who does miracles, turns water into wine, and we'll read later about how God heals as well. So let's sing together our God, which is water you turned into wine.
Morning, everybody. Um, we're here again for an interview this week. We've got Janet with us. Good morning, Janet. Morning. <laughs> okay, so it was great to have Jason last week, and each week or, or every couple of weeks, we're going to try and interview someone different, find out what's going on in their life over this difficult time. Janet, we just thought we'd start with you because, um, well, first of all, how are you doing in isolation, you and your family? We're all right. Um, we're obviously all four of us at home pretty much all the time. Um, so I normally work in a preschool. So obviously the preschool is closed. So I'm at home, but working as much as I can doing related stuff for that. Uh, David's working at home and the children are at home doing schoolwork. So we're all at home. Um, things are going all right. Just a bit of juggling, trying to fit everything in and you know, f yeah, fit all the different things in that different people need to do. Yeah, it's quite difficult, isn't it? The more the more you have in the household, the harder it becomes. But, yeah. <laughs> so um, I think one of the reasons that Stu suggested that we interviewed you is because you've actually had the coronavirus earlier on, you suspect. Would you like to share a little bit about uh, that with us? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think I probably had it. I wasn't tested or anything, so I can't be absolutely sure. Um, but back at the, the end of March, in fact, the weekend when the lockdown started, mm -hmm. um, I definitely had a virus, which I strongly suspect to have been the coronavirus. Um, you know, high temperature, bit of shortness of breath, bit of a cough. Thankfully, that bit wasn't too bad for me. Um, and I did recover reasonably quickly, um, but felt pretty ill for the first few days. And then it took me a All good right. couple of weeks to get back to normal I was just really really tired it did you know wipe me out yeah quite and did a lot. the rest of your family get it or not not really they seem to have escaped it so, okay. so obviously we can't be completely sure that's what it was but we're you know we think it probably probably was yes okay well so so how did you find that um affected your relationship with god as such did you you know i guess being away from church being away from everyone you probably wanted to be if you were feeling ill but um could, could you still have your relationship with god sort that out i don't know <laughs> I, yeah i've i've actually found during that time when i was ill and then the few weeks since then my relationship with god has actually been pretty good obviously very different from normal and yeah. I am missing the normal church activities that we do yes. um, you know I'm usually there two or three times a week for one reason or another so I am definitely missing that but what I have found is that um, God has been I've sort of felt that God has been in my house more than right. he normally is if that makes sense okay. um, because obviously I've watched the online services I watched some of the spring harvest things um, listening to worship music and so on in the house and I, I kind of had more of a sense of God's presence with me while I've been in the house which in my normal life doesn't happen so much and do you feel so like doing do you feel like you've had to make an effort to get there or has that just come naturally um, I think to start with it was an effort mm. um, because it was so different but as we've gone on through these few weeks, it's now becoming more natural. And I've sort of got into a bit more of a routine of doing different things at different times. Yeah. And the one thing that I, the one thing that I miss is that um, when I'm traveling to and from work, which is a time when I'm usually on my own, yes. um, I do often have worship songs on in the car. And mm. so I'm missing that bit. That's kind of my little bit of, quiet time on my own yourself with God yeah. during my normal yeah. normal day so you've had to share that more with your family and are they responding well to that <laughs> yeah I mean we've watched we've certainly watched the services together and that's been a really nice family time yeah. um, where we've sort of joked about the fact that church is happening in our house at the moment um, but I think that's actually in a sense been quite special because we have done it in our own house and there's been that real presence of god in yes. our house yeah and i have noticed that your children have had some of their craft on our um, facebook page which is nice yeah I, they do I like a been, bit of craft i haven't been that good i have to say <laughs> mine have done the coloring <laughs> sheets though as i keep saying to people they're quite good to um just print off some of that stuff before the service for the children isn't it so they they can do yes. things alongside it 
if it's getting a little bit long but actually it's nice that they can all do and be part of that and um, one of the questions I asked Jason last week and I'll ask you the same is do you think God's saying anything through uh, to you through this time and uh, you know is there a verse or a song or something you would share that's really speaking to you yeah, I mean, I felt really reassured by God through this time, actually. As I say, knowing his presence there with me um, and a sort of a sense of, of him being that real kind of rock, that support. Um, and I have got a, a few verses that I'll, yeah, I'll read in a minute. And a, a song as well that really spoke to me. It was one evening um, when I was watching one of the Spring Harvest things. And to be quite honest, I wasn't in the best of moods that day. It had been a pretty rough day and I was actually sat there feeling quite sorry for myself in the <laughs> evening I thought I'm sure we've all had those days <laughs> yeah watching it anyway um and then when it came to the worship bit towards the end um they sang faithful one which we have sung quite a few times in church yeah. before but it it really hit the spot it really spoke to me and I you know I do believe that that was directed at me from yes. God in okay. that moment because they actually started halfway through the song so they just came in with the bit that goes you are my rock in times of trouble uh -huh. and as I was sat there feeling a bit sorry for myself yeah. that just really spoke to me and I, it almost kind of shook me up and I just kind of thought oh yeah actually it's all fine you are there and yeah. I don't need to be like this yeah. and I think um, if all goes to plan we're going to sing that in a minute after we finish this interview so hopefully we're all here that yeah. song to encourage us yeah. That would be great, yeah. yeah. Um, and a couple, uh, there's a couple of bits of um, psalms as well that, okay. that I've been reading that have on a similar, similar sort of um, theme. Let me just read one of them if I can find it now. <laughs> so it's um, Psalm um, 62, um, verse 5, and the next few verses. Um, I depend on God alone. I put my hope in him. He alone protects and saves me. He is my defender and I shall never be defeated. My salvation and honour depend on God. He is my strong protector. He is my shelter. Wow. They're good verses to hold on to, aren't they? Mm. To always know that God is there to keep us safe yeah. and uh, yeah, keep us going through this odd time that yeah, yeah. has its ups Very and downs. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I'm sure, you know, for everyone, it's going to have its ups and downs. And, um, you know, we've mm. got that confidence that God is there to protect us. So that's great. And... Um, can we pray for you, Janet? Like we yeah, did last week for Jason, we're going to pray for you if that's okay. And the church is all going to pray for you as we, we pray. That'd be lovely. Okay. Because yeah. God is out of time and it doesn't matter when we're here and yeah. when the whole church is. So let's pray. Barbara, I thank you for Janet. I thank you for all that you're doing in her life. I thank you that um, although she did catch this virus, she came through smoothly. And Father, I thank you that through that time, she knew your presence. And although she felt really rough, you were there and you brought healing and we thank you for that father and we thank you for your protection of the rest of the family and we just pray your continued protection on them as a family and father i thank you for these words that you're giving to janet through through worship through music and through your scriptures father i thank you that you are her protection her her refuge her strength and i thank you that we can always come to you and father i just pray that you would really bless janet and david and Martha and Anna in this time, Father, I pray they'd have good family times and that you would continue to be at the centre of their home. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for giving up a little bit of your afternoon today right. uh, to you. share with us all on Sunday morning. Uh, yeah, bless you. And if anyone else has anything they'd like to share, or we might collar you otherwise, <laughs> but it's good just to have different faces, I think, with us in the service mm. and um, just to pack up with people. So thank you, Janet. I'm going to turn. Okay. Has it stopped? I don't know. I think it's pulled.
Hello, my name's Andy Morley. I'm one of the preaching teams at Melbourne Baptist Church, and I'm currently standing at the north end uh, of the village, uh, just up a little bit from the science park, um, which is down there. So why would I have come here to start our reflection today? Well, actually, um, not far from here was believed to be a Roman encampment or fort. So this is a sort of Port Way and Armington Avenue over there. And it was somewhere over there. And in the field somewhere behind us, there's evidence of um, a Roman cemetery, apparently. And a little bit further over that way, uh, towards the back of the RSPP bird sanctuary, um, is where it was believed to have been a Roman settlement. And our Bible reading for today features um, a centurion and his interactions with Jesus. And while I can't, of course, be sure that a centurion stood here and looked over this view, it's not, of course, beyond the bounds of possibility. So it seemed like a good place to come and do our reading today, which is from Luke chapter 7, starting to read at verse 1. When Jesus had completed all his words in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion's servant, who was dear to him, was sick and ready to die. And when the centurion heard of Jesus, he sent the elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they asked him earnestly, saying, You should do this for him, for he is worthy, for he loves our nation, and he is built as a synagogue. So Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Likewise, I did not think myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these words, he marvelled at him, and turned and said to the people who followed him, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then those who were sent returned to the house and found the servant well who had been sick. The Reverend Geoffrey John is the Dean of St Albans and he's also an author and he wrote a book a while back called The Meaning of the Miracles. And it's a book that really changed the way I thought about the miracle stories in the Gospels. He quotes St Augustine and says this, Let us ask the miracles themselves what they tell us about Christ for they have a tongue of their own, if it can only be understood. Because Christ is the word of God, all the acts of the word also become words to us. The miracle which we admire on the outside has something inside which must be understood. If we see a beautiful piece of handwriting, we're not satisfied simply to notice that the letters are formed evenly, equally and elegantly. We also want to know the meaning the letters convey. In the same way, a miracle is not like a picture, something merely to look at and admire, and to be left at that. It's much more like a piece of writing, which we must learn to read and understand. And what that book really suggests, and that quote, is that when we come to read an account of a miracle like this, we should ask some questions around why the Gospel writer wanted us to know about this particular miracle. There are clearly so many that we only know in passing, and it's safe for, therefore safe to assume that there's many more that we're totally ignorant of. So why this one? Well, not only why this one, but why at this point in the account of Jesus' life? What are the wider meanings we're supposed to read, to carry on St Albans' analogy, in to this miracle? So in the chapters before this one we've just read, there's no shortage of miracles. Everything from monster caches of fish and healings of people with fever, skin diseases, mental illnesses and evil spirits. In fact, so many we just get bashing mentions of miracles in many cases. So clearly the focus in this one story is not so much on Jesus' power to heal. This passage starts with when Jesus completed all his words. So clearly, whatever is being communicated here is very closely linked to those words. And they are words that, in just a short number of verses, really encapsulate the good news of this upside-down kingdom of Jesus that, uh, that we've been thinking about in this series of Luke. At the heart of Luke's version of what we've been looking at in our house group as the Sermon of the Mount, which is in Matthew's Gospel, of course, we get this 
topsy-turvy, blessed ours of the Beatitudes. We're challenged to love our enemies and to break the cycle of violence by turning the other cheek. We're called out for our hypocrisy in the way we judge others and in talking of trees and their fruit and in laughing at wise and foolish builders we are shown that following God has to be something that's based in actions rather than merely words. So, after all that has been said, we get into our current account from the life of Jesus that we read over by the site of our own local Roman history. Our verses today are set in the town of Capernaum on the shores of the large inland lake which is known as the Sea of Galilee. Well, I can't take you there or even to the sea, but we are next to just uh, a very small lake that's outside um, Shepherd. Capernaum was the town Jesus went to uh, after his, he was in his hometown in Nazareth and they sort of uh, chased him out from there, as Stuart described to us a couple of weeks ago. Jesus seemed to be a regular in that synagogue in Capernaum and really that town became his base for his ministry and life around um, Galilee for the next couple of years. This region of Galilee, and indeed the northern part of what we call Palestine or Israel today, was quite multicultural by the uh, standards of the day, even though it was perhaps looked down as a bit backwards uh, by uh, Jerusalem and Judea in the south. The area had been under a lot of Greek influence for several generations. And it was ruled by a Herod, Herod Antipas, and he was a puppet Roman governor. But it wasn't subject to the same military control uh, and occupation that existed further south in Judea and around Jerusalem. So to be honest with you, we've got to guess exactly what the position this centurion had in the local community. And the relationship was probably a bit complicated, a bit subtle, a bit difficult at times, given the local politics. But what's also a clear subtext from uh, Luke, who was of course a non-Jew himself, was that this man wasn't Jewish, he was a Gentile. And in this sense we're already seeing, even right at the start, that this story is quite radical and challenging uh, and was helping us to think that Jesus came to share his good news with those beyond the Jewish nation. So we've read that he was a sin um, the centurion who provided for the building of the local synagogue. Did that mean he was already interested and in following after the God uh, the, the Jews spoke of? Well, we don't know, and it's not really clear how much significance we could place on the building of the synagogue, for that was actually recorded in uh, Roman history uh, in a number of other places as well. It seemed to be a technique that the Romans used, building and supporting the local community. Um, it helped them, they believed, in kind of keeping control and improving uh, the moral behaviour of the local community. and was quite widely practised by Romans as they occupied different parts of the world. But whatever his motivations, it did stand him in good stead with the community leaders when he came to make his request of Jesus. So in the previous couple of chapters in Luke, we read of miracles that Jesus did in the synagogue itself. And while we don't know for sure that it was this same synagogue that the centurion built, it seems pretty likely given the size of the town. So of course it's no surprise that Jesus came to the attention of this centurion. But even as the powerful man he clearly was, his approach to Jesus shows a great deal of humility and sensitivity to the practices of the Jewish faith. Not knowing Jewish Jesus personally and recognising his Jewish heritage, the soldier sends some representatives of Jesus' own community to plead his case. There's no demand made of Jesus. Um, it's only a request. But as we'll see, it's a request that Jesus has no hesitation in responding to, even if that meant crossing the boundaries of what would be normally acceptable behaviour for a Jewish rabbi or indeed um, any Jewish man of good standing. So what of this servant and the centurion's concern for him? On the one hand, most of the uh, Greek words that are in the, the Bible passage that we uh, read are just the usual Greek word for slave. And as such, the centurion had no real responsibility uh, to take care of him in the way that we see him do. Some Roman writers have pointed out that actually under Roman law, uh, a master had a right to kill his slave, and especially if he became sick and was no longer able to work. 
However, when we have the centurion himself quoted as speaking, the word he uses to refer to his sick servant is much more family oriented. You know, we might paraphrase it, phrase it by him saying, but say the word and my boy will be healed. While we don't get more insight into the uh, place the sick boy had in the centurion's household, it's clear that we're witnessing an approach to Jesus that came out of a real and felt need by this otherwise very powerful man. So that's the background to our story with Jesus in the town of Capernaum by the lake and the powerful Roman officer facing a situation beyond his own abilities to put right and asking for Jesus' intervention. But are there things already in this 2,000 year old account that can speak into our lives today? Firstly, I take a lot of personal encouragement from this story, showing that it's right to ask Jesus for his intervention when things are beyond our own strengths and abilities. It's very easy to think that we have to deal with everything on our own, or that asking for help is a sign of weakness. That's not how the centurion sees it. He understands about authority and control, and he knows that in this life and death situation, he doesn't have the power and authority needed but he recognises Jesus does, and he's not afraid to ask. He makes his request with a fair degree of humility, but also confidence and faith that Jesus is able to intervene in power. We see similar confidence, trust and faith actually in the Psalms. Of course, most famously, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And Jesus himself, as he's teaching his disciples how to pray, also, ex also expresses that same confidence. So don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but as your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. And St Paul tells the Philippians in his letter, don't be anxious about anything. Rather, bring all of your requests to God in your prayers and petitions, along with giving thanks. At this very uncertain time, when we don't know what's going to be thrown at us and whether we'll be able to cope, we too can take comfort from this story. Jesus is not only ready to answer the centurion's request, but commends him for actually as a good example of what having faith in Jesus is really all about. Secondly, especially at this time when we're, we are at a distance from each other, we can't physically gather as a church, it's worth remembering that distance and geography were no barriers to Jesus. And this is something that the centurion grasps. He understands Jesus' authority. So even while humbly explaining that he's unworthy to receive Jesus' help, he adds that Jesus can exercise his authority anywhere you know, the centurion knows what it is to be under authority and to issue commands like go and come and do this. You know, he reasons that if such authority works for a soldier, surely it works for Jesus. He knows that Jesus' authority is all that's needed to produce healing, regardless of distance, without that need for physical proximity. You know, again, as we reach out to God in prayer for ourselves and our families, our neighbours, for each other in the church family and our world, we can help, uh, we can ask God to help us emulate the faith of this centurion. To recognise that Jesus' authority and power do not know physical boundaries and aren't constrained by the restrictions that we face, especially at the moment. Paul, when he's praying in Ephesians, prayed that they may be able to comprehend with all the saints, and of course that includes us today, what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. Thirdly, Jesus doesn't let ethnic distinctions, tribal barriers and political enmity get in the way of meeting human need when he's invited to meet it. This event that we see in Luke's Gospel allows Luke to show that Jews and Gentiles can get along. A message of ethnic and racial cooperation that would have been revolutionary in ancient times and still is to a large degree today. 
One of the most encouraging things I'm seeing in our current crisis is that help is being offered across the boundaries that so often do exist in our society. For example, age, both very young and very old, are raising money for an NHS. We only need to look at Captain Tom Moore and the many others of different ages that he's inspired. There's much sharing encouragement through our making and displaying of rainbows, clapping in our streets for our carers and key workers, uh, creating bear hunts and treasure hunts for families to do on their daily exercise. And those who have more are finding the joy that comes from being able to share it with those less fortunate. I know for a while uh, within the church we had uh, the idea of WWJD question, you know, what would Jesus do? This story shows us clearly what Jesus does do when faced with a need. He steps forward to meet it, even if that involves reaching out across the normal divides in our society and outside his own religious beliefs. You know, we can only imagine the impact if the whole church were able to visibly show how Christ leads us to work together across the divisions in our society to meet the needs we find around us. Above all else though, this story speaks to us of what Jesus saw in the centurion. And that is why Luke includes it in the story in the, the point he does. Up to now, Luke's been showing us what Jesus can do and what his teachings are. But this chapter seven, and especially this account, is a real turning point, a pivot point in Luke's narrative. Luke is beginning to make this personal, to start to ask, what are we going to do about this Jesus? This passage is often titled something like the faith of the centurion, if you look at it in a Bible. In fact, the title for today's uh, talk in our series is the faith of a foreigner. Faith, that is what Luke wants us to be focusing on as we read this account. So the emphasis in this account therefore makes this miracle different from the earlier miracle accounts in Luke. Here the miracle itself is not really the focus since it's mentioned only very briefly in verse 10. Rather the stress is on the attitude of the one who's seeking healing. Luke subtly shifts attention from Jesus' miraculous work to Jesus' person and especially to the response to that person. In the Gospels, it's rare that someone receives a clear uh, commendation from Jesus. And when it happens, it's an occasion for reflection, you know, for us to really sit up and take notice. The powerful and poignant testimony of the centurion provides such an opportunity, showing us that people in very surprising places and with very different backgrounds have heard Jesus's message and responded to it. When Jesus hears the message that the centurion sends back with his friends, recognizing Jesus's authority and power, he reacts emotionally. He's amazed, the scripture says. Jesus turns and issues his commendation. I have not found such great faith even in Israel. This statement is like a giant flashing neon billboard. Here is faith that should be emulated. Here is trust. Here is confidence resting in the authority of God and trusting in his plan. You know, the Jewish nation could certainly have learned from this outsider. And of course, we 2000 years later can learn too. What Jesus is communicating is what faith in him looks like. I said a few minutes ago, the teaching Jesus had been giving just before this account shows that following God has to be something that is based in action rather than merely words. That for me is what faith is, not some logical assent to a set of beliefs or activities we do in a religious community but something we live every day in our attitudes, in our behaviours, in our relationships and in the way we trust God. You know, it's for this reason that I find the account of uh, the centurion in Luke and in Matthew as well so inspiring. 
he knew he wasn't worthy of Jesus. Yet, he had faith to place those he cared for most in his household into Jesus' hands and found that trust met right back with the loving faithfulness of Jesus. Let's just pray. Loving Heavenly Father, thank you for this account in your scriptures that encourages us in our walk of faith with you. We thank you that we can see your healing power at work in this story. When you are invited in faith into our lives in times of need, we're reassured that we see that Jesus' healing power was available even when he was separated from those seeking him. Even as we are separated from each other as members of your family here on earth at this time. Lord, help us to rely on you as the centurion did. And that through this, we might deepen our faith in you. Lord, we ask that you will visit us as your dispersed people and pour out your strength and courage upon us that we may hurry to make your welcome known not only in our concern for others but by serving them generously and faithfully in your name. Amen. Hi I'm Beth and I'm one of the missionary secretaries at Melbourne Baptist Church. Each month within our church we share updates about those who we are supporting who are working in different parts of the world. So we'll begin with John and Sue Wilson. They work for BMS, the Baptist Missionary Society, and they're based in Paris. Sadly, their July visit to see us um, has been cancelled, so we won't be able to catch up with, with them in person this year, but fingers crossed for 2021. They're both now fully recovered after they were ill with coronavirus-like symptoms. Um, and like many people, they're getting to grips with running their church uh, virtually. They ask for prayers for older members of their congregation, particularly those who are living alone. Uh, Phil and Rosemary Halliday, they are also uh, with BMS. Um, they work in a place called Massey, which is just outside Paris. Uh, they're on the sixth week of their lockdown, which is much stricter than ours. Um, if they're going out, they're only allowed out for an hour a day. They have to take a permission slip to tell people where they're going if they get stopped and they have to have their identity card, so much stricter than here. Um, they lead a team of people who are in turn leading church plants within France. Um, they've been encouraging those at Le Cedre, which is the um, language school, uh, which they support pastorally. And that's where many people go to learn French before they move out to other places within France and other French speaking parts of the world. Um, so there are people who are currently stuck there because they cannot go anywhere else. So they've been supporting them pastorally, checking up on those. They've been running Bible groups and their prayer groups and church services via Zoom. And like the Wilsons, they are also getting to grips with running church virtually. And they think obviously that's going to continue for a little while with them. So just getting the hang of it now. We also pray for the Shrub Soul family, for Gareth, Beth, Sam, Jonah and Eva. They're based with BMS in Chad. Um, they, they, Gareth works um, within the hospital there as one of the um, senior management team and Beth is a music therapist who's also working within the hospital and uh, in other places as well. Um, it's still very hot there, up to 45 degrees, so they're still enduring the season, the hot season which will run through till about June. Um, and that's one of their prayer requests that um, we can uh, pray that they have the endurance for that and that tempers don't get too frayed within that heat. Um, with regards to coronavirus, they reported at the beginning of April that there'd only been a handful of cases so far, but they're not sure if that's because people are staying at home, um, because they have a fear of catching the virus or because they physically can't get to the hospital. Obviously a concern of people working at the hospital is that other things will, um, other diseases won't be treated because of people not being able to get there. Um, one of the plus sides is that there's been a fundraising drive through BMS and they've now got lots more hand washing facilities out, physically outside the hospital in Chad, which is really great because I'm, I'm not sure access to water is available for everybody. Um, and they've got an x-ray department which is finally up and running, uh, which obviously is really handy in a hospital. 
Um, so as I've said, they've asked for prayers for endurance during the rest of the hot season, that the coronavirus doesn't run completely rampant in Chad, and that the senior management team within the um, within the hospital are given wisdom for the decisions that they have to make um, as time goes on. We've also got a, um, a recording from the Fry family with their update, which hopefully you'll be able to watch now. So hello from the Fries in Austria, and uh, we'd like to send you our greetings and thanks for praying for us. Uh, Marlena, this is your opportunity to share something. <laughs> yeah, thank you ever so much for praying for us. Um, as with you, we have uh, sort of locked down as well. We haven't really left the house very much in these last six weeks, except for shopping. Um, my particular challenge is really with the girls, with homeschooling, because they are not really very motivated um, and it's hard to, to get the work done that we need to do for school. So I'd be very grateful if you could, could carry on praying for us. On that front, we have at least another two to three weeks of homeschooling. But the end is inside. The end is inside. Yes. <laughs> Yes. So yeah, pray for a good atmosphere between us because sometimes the girls are frustrated, I'm frustrated. So we'd really appreciate your prayer for us on that side of things. Thank you. Yeah, and on the OM side of things, well, I'm very busy. Um, I spend probably too long down here in what is my remote office. And uh, yeah, there's plenty of good things happening, plenty of networking. Uh, people coming together, we're starting to see the foundational steps for this media hub coming together. And the media hub is that component of online mission that is uh, missing in many, um, uh, amongst many teams. And, uh, and I guess you experience this too yourself in the church setting. You have online prayer meetings, Bible studies, services. Uh, but what about the missional component? And that is the component we're seeking to address. So praise God for the good progress. There's a lot of work ahead. Um, pray for the right people to connect with us uh, and for the funding that uh, is needed to help move things forward. And um, that this tool would be a real blessing, uh, not only in the OM world, but uh, beyond as well. Thank you so much. God bless. Bye. Bye-bye. And then we also pray for Christ Hope, which is a charity that we have many links with, um, which is based in Africa. Um, we're particularly going to pray for the care ministry point in Keatsman Hoop in Namibia. They'd like us to praise God for those who have continued to donate, to support and to pray for them. And they're thanking God for the continued protection over the children and staff. They've asked for prayers for those who are living in difficult conditions and in particular for two of the children, Teo and Kabali, whose grandmother has recently died. They were very close to her um, and they're finding this obviously a really distressing time. So they've asked for prayers for their healing and comfort. So now we're gonna spend a few minutes just praying together. Let's pray. Dear Father, we gather together and share stories and prayer requests from those who we know around the world often is the way there are many similar themes within the prayers this month. For John and Sue and for Phil and Rosemary we ask for your blessing on them as they find new ways to do and be church in France. Encourage them as they share your love with their congregations who although separate can still be together through the wonders of technology. For the Shrub Soul family in Chad continue to keep them safe as the virus spreads through Africa. We give thanks that there are now much more hand washing facilities available in Guinea Bore at the hospital. And for David and Marlene, we pray for patience as they continue to homeschool the girls. And again, give thanks for the blessing that the media hub that David is working with has begun to be really helpful and that that will continue. And for Christ's hope in Keep Man's Hoop in Namibia, we thank you for your continued provision to the children there. We ask for protection on those who are living in difficult circumstances. Be with Teo and Kabali and all others who mourn. 
be their strength and comfort in these strange and difficult times. We bring all prayers in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We've come to the end of our time today and uh, we continue to pray that you're doing well at this time of isolation. We know it's, it's just not easy, is it? Please do contact me if there's anything that we can do for you as a church. Others have already contacted us and you'd just be joining them. 
Uh, you should have received our weekly newsletter. And uh, if, you're, if you're not for any reason, do let us know and we can sort that out for you. You know what? It's been a great pleasure and a privilege to see our children sending in pictures of what they've done uh, in response to the newsletter. And well done parents, well done children for that. It's been great to see that on Facebook. If you've got a testimony in time of isolation, through the last few weeks we had Jason and then we had Janet uh, today, and uh, in the future we will have more. And if you'd like to join in with that too, it would be great uh, to let us know uh, that you would want to do that. And also, if there's anything else with the newsletter you'd like to contribute, do let us know, do, do again get in contact. Well, it's been great to, to, today to have so many folk involved again in the service. And we look forward to next week where there hopefully will be more as well joining us so that we share ministry together. And so to conclude our time together, let's say uh, this final blessing together. And please, I commend you to say it out loud. It's from number six. And it's often referred to as the priestly blessing. So let's, uh, as we are... Uh, the priest of all believers, let's say this blessing together. So may the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.